Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us today on Heritage Events Live. My name is Zach Smith, and I serve as a legal fellow in the Heritage Foundation's Mies Center for Legal and Judicial Studies. It's my pleasure to welcome everyone to today's event, Human Trafficking Policy Prescriptions to Hold Criminals Accountable and Help Their Victims. This is our second event in our two-part series for Human Trafficking Prevention Month. The first event, hosted by one of my Heritage Foundation colleagues, focused on state-sponsored human trafficking. Today's event focuses on human trafficking happening in our own backyard here in the United States. Unfortunately, human trafficking is a major problem facing our nation today. Over the past several years, law enforcement at the local, state, and federal level have made combating it a top priority. We have a great panel lined up for you today to discuss their own experiences investigating and prosecuting human trafficking offenses, to talk about what's worked and what hasn't from a policy standpoint, and to discuss briefly how Biden administration's priorities might differ from the Trump administration's. As we go through today's event, please be sure to submit any questions you might have, and we'll have an opportunity to answer those at the end of the program. I'm delighted to now invite our speakers to join us on screen as I give a brief introduction of them. So if our speakers can join me, please, that would be fantastic. Great. On our panel today, we have three distinguished guests. Uh, the first is the Honorable G. Zachary Terwilliger. Zach is currently a partner in the Washington, D.C. office of Vincent and Elkins, before joining that firm, he served as the U.S. Attorney for the Eastern District of Virginia, where he oversaw a staff of approximately 250 prosecutors, civil litigators, and support personnel. Prior to his appointment as U.S. Attorney, Zach served as an Associate Deputy Attorney General and as Chief of Staff in the Office of the Deputy Attorney General. Uh, very relevant to our conversation here today, Zach began his career in the Eastern District of Virginia as a line prosecutor assigned to the Major Crimes Unit where, among other types of cases, he prosecuted human trafficking cases and oversaw a law enforcement task force that focused on combating human trafficking. On our panel today, we also have Bill Wolf. Bill is currently the Principal Deputy Director of the Office for Victims of Crime at the Department of Justice. He also served as the DOJ's, he's also serving as the DOJ's Director of Human Trafficking Programs, and he served as a Special Advisor for Human Trafficking to the White House during the Trump administration. Bill began his career as a police officer, where he was promoted to a detective, and it's there that he became aware of the, the issue of human trafficking. While working cases as a detective, uh, not only did Bill help to investigate human trafficking cases, he also helped to start and lead a human trafficking task force in Northern Virginia. Bill also served as the executive director of the Just Ask Prevention Project and as the director of the National Human Trafficking Intelligence Center. Due to his fantastic work in this area, Bill received the Presidential Medal for Extraordinary Efforts to Combat Trafficking in Persons. And then last, but certainly not least, we have the Honorable Ken Cuccinelli. Ken most recently served as the Acting Deputy Secretary of Homeland Security in the Trump administration. Prior to that, he served as the 46th Attorney General of the Commonwealth of Virginia. And while holding both of these positions, as well as others, Ken made fighting human trafficking a major focus. During his tenure as Attorney General, he aggressively prosecuted human traffickers, and worked with members of Virginia's General Assembly to pass anti-human trafficking legislation. He has received widespread recognition for his help in leading the fight against human trafficking, and we're very grateful to have him as well as our other panelists with us today. So thank you all for joining us. And if it's okay with everyone, I think we'll just dive right into the conversation uh, and get started. And so I was hoping uh, one of you, maybe Bill, if you're willing to, just kind of give us an overview of when we say human trafficking, uh, what are we talking about exactly? That's great, Zach, and uh, just thank you for, for hosting this and the Heritage Foundation for bringing attention to this issue. And uh, it really is a pleasure to be on the panel with uh, uh, two very distinct colleagues of mine, uh, kind of like bringing the band back together back in the day when I was a detective and. Zach was a prosecutor, and uh, General Cuccinelli was uh, leading the, the efforts in the state of Virginia. 
we worked some of the largest cases, uh, really started to uncover uh, the issue of, of gang controlled human trafficking. One case in particular, the underground gangster crypts. And that was really, I think, for a lot of us, uh, an entryway into understanding this world of human trafficking that uh, really existed in the shadows for such a long time. And so we talked about human trafficking, uh, uh, sort of a definition I like to use is it's compelling another person to engage in either forced labor or commercial sex. And it's, it's really about using force, fraud, and coercion uh, to profit off of another individual. Uh, and so um, certainly it has an incredible impact uh, on the individuals that are victimized, but also on the communities that are affected and impacted as well by its priority stress. Great. Thanks for that overview. Uh, Zach, Ken, is there anything you would like to, to add to that? Well, Bill's comment about the growth in understanding has been something that is itself a study. If you go back, the analogy for me, particularly when I was attorney general, was to gangs. And there were a lot, you go around Virginia, and uh, of course, Bill was a detective in my home county, so I, I got that benefit. But, uh, you know, you go around Virginia in 91, 92, 93, work your way through the years, and uh, the gangs were there. They were growing. Um, they were growing in influence. Um, they were growing in, uh, in in boldness. But a lot of law enforcement uh, didn't face up to it. They we don't have a gang problem. You know that was a, and, and we were years behind it. And that experience, I think, once the kind of um, cases and evidence that Bill just described could put be put in front of prosecutors and law enforcement they were a lot more open to not making that mistake again. And uh, so the acceptance of the problem, which sounds like a, like a silly thing to have to start with, but it is what you have to start with, um, was much quicker in this space. That doesn't mean it was quick. It was just quicker or maybe less slow. Um, but really it's, it's become very universal. Um, uh, you mentioned the, the casework that uh, Zach was in on, that Bill was in on, that my office as AG was in on. We've, you know, we're all from Virginia, so we've done this together before. And um, uh, when we started my term as AG, Virginia was considered in the red by the Polaris Project, one of these nonprofits that rates how tough states are on trafficking. By the end of those four years, we were in the green. Um, and we got there because when there's acceptance of the problem, Bipartisanship uh, seems to rule the day in this area. Not something people are used to, but uh, but it but it definitely happened and it caught fire. And um, and once it did, once we were able to demonstrate the problem, uh, we really could pave our way to some solutions. Now we still live with the problem, but we know we have it. We're facing up to it, um, and states have a role. The federal government has a role and uh, happy to talk about what those different roles might be. But it's been a, a faster evolution than some other law enforcement challenges uh, that we've faced in the last couple of decades. And Zach, if, uh, if you'd like to jump in, you know, maybe one of the things that would be, be helpful for our audience to know is why are gangs in particular uh, drawn to human trafficking? Yeah, um, one of the things I think uh, that I experienced directly as a prosecutor was that um, it was it was just constant that these different gangs are looking for a revenue stream. And so when it came to human trafficking, it was right there in front of them. There was incredibly high demand. And I'm talking when we're talking human trafficking in this context, I'm talking sex trafficking as opposed to labor trafficking. Incredibly high demand. Um, for uh, sex trafficking victims um, by those who were who were who were buying uh, these these girls, and the gang had um, a lot of young women who were already in and around the gang, not generally as members, but as people who were either girlfriends or folks who who were around them. And as a result, uh, when it came to okay, we can make money illicitly through extortion, through drug dealing, through strong arm robbery. 
um, or sex trafficking, sex trafficking actually allowed for the most control in terms of you can kind of set the parameters of the way this is going to go in terms of what you're going to charge, who you're going to interact with. You only interact with vetted individuals. And um, when Detective Wolf and I were working these cases together, it sort of dawned on us at one point that when it comes to human trafficking, it's not that difficult um, for these individuals to set up a very low tech operation, but become very profitable because unlike narcotics, um, a human being, and this is the awfulness of it can be sold over and over and over again versus an ounce of cocaine or a pound of marijuana, et cetera. Um, and uh, you can um, you know, decide how much, if any money, you want to give that individual. In a lot of cases, you know, they're basically kidnapped um, and held as sex slaves. And so no money was was given to the to the victim in this instance. And so, you know, it costs costed them very little. Uh, in terms of you know setting up the operation and, and really could reap um, a, a lot of illicit profits. And um, given the demand and the ability to evade detection, um, it also that that was the angle they went down. highly profitable, hard to hard to convict. And also the one thing that's unique to gangs as opposed to someone who's just trafficking women or girls um, in their own capacity is they've got a built-in distribution network with all the gang members. Um, every A lot of the gang members in Northern Virginia work day jobs. Um, and so they're, they're talking to their friends about, are you interested in girls? I can bring them by. Um, okay, well, the police are starting to really get on our case in Alexandria, Virginia. Let's move out to Prince William County. Let's move out to you know Maryland. And so when you have a gang that spreads its tentacles in and around a particular geographic area, knows a lot of people, and also has a penchant for silencing witnesses and intimidating people, even if you were a good Samaritan and saw this going on in your neighborhood, the gang's incredibly intimidating and would think nothing of coming and physically attacking you or hurting you um, for, for ratting them out. And so it was just this perfect storm uh, that really allowed the gangs to um, to to, to engage in this hor horrible conduct. Now you mentioned that that a lot of the gang members were engaging in sex trafficking as opposed to labor trafficking. And so I'd throw it out to the group and see if someone might like to explain the difference between sex trafficking and labor trafficking uh, and kind of any similarities or differences for how you would investigate and prosecute uh, those two different types of, of human trafficking. So I'll, I'll throw it out to anyone who would like well, I mean, to. We can use real world examples is probably the easiest way. So there is a fairly sizable case, federal case, that um, DHS worked with DOJ on in, uh, I want to say New York. It was, um, and what they were doing was they were illegally bringing in Vietnamese women and they were working in nail salons. It wasn't sex trafficking, but they were holding their status and documents effectively hostage. So these folks couldn't go elsewhere. And, um, and they were, they turned it into a business. And um, like I said, it wasn't sex trafficking, which is more common and, and more vicious, dehumanizing. Um, nonetheless, that's an example of what labor trafficking might look like. Um, they, the, to Bill's early point, it's still fraud and coercion are used, there are elements here, but it isn't uh, holding a person at knife point all the time, which is what you might think of, and threatening them physically, which does happen, like Zach described, uh, particularly in the sex trafficking environment. But they, they hold them in a position of vulnerability relative to the law, and they keep them there intentionally, and they manipulate that. Uh, so that, that's how labor trafficking often takes place. Um, and really it's just on the scale of evil, if you will, it's just a little farther down the scale from sex trafficking, but similar tactics, similar techniques. And who do you primarily see doing the, the labor trafficking as opposed to the sex trafficking? You know, I know both you and Zach and Bill all mentioned gangs uh, being involved. Uh, who else is involved in this, and what types of victims uh, do you typically see uh, who are being trafficked, if there even is such a thing as a as a typical victim? So in the labor trafficking circumstance, and Zach may have a different view of it, my experience is that you don't have the kind of gang participation that you do in the sex trafficking. Um, 
you have, and we'll stay with the Vietnamese example, what they did is they set up um, a pipeline where they tell a story over in Vietnam and they get women into this pipeline and they get them to what amounts to, for those women, a dead end um, where they're stuck, where they've got the leverage over them. And, um, but again, it's not sex trafficking. And so these are folks who have networks in the community, both in Vietnam and in the United States, and it can be another country. I mean, this happens in other forms of labor uh, down to South and Central America. I mean, we can go around the world with different examples of it. Um, but in the labor trafficking situation, um, these folks are typically, uh, they come up with a scheme, they put it in place, um, and they're not so much using violence as they are legal threats uh, being held over uh, the victim's heads. Yeah, I would just add to, I, I agree with everything General Cuccinelli said. Um, what I would add into the mix is the fact that, um, you know, typically there is something, uh, as he mentioned, that's being held over these individuals' heads. And a lot of times it's what, what we refer to as debt bondage. So, you know, it cost me, you know, $2,000 to fly you from Indonesia here. So every month, you know, I'm not going to pay you. You're just going to pay off your debt to get here, even though there was an employment contract. Or, um, you know, I'm I'm clothing you, I'm feeding you, and you charge sort of exorbitant rates for that. Um, there's also uh, uh, document um, servitude where. I won't give you your passport back, or I won't give you a certain document, or, and a lot of it too is folks who are brought into the United States who may not understand our culture, and they may be coming from a repressive regime. Um, one of the cases that we've seen in the past are with certain diplomats who may come from a country with a caste system, and they tell individuals of a lower caste, you know, it's just like it was back home, you know, you can't walk outside, and if any neighbors see you here, you know, and they basically create this false false narrative um, and set and you know basically isolate them you know you're not allowed to watch your native language TV you're not allowed to make phone calls um, and in fact you know I'm really putting myself out there by by helping you and, and those sorts of things and it creates this power dynamic this vulnerability that's exploited um, beyond that uh, just from the, the course I used to teach on human trafficking you see also a lot of labor trafficking in agriculture and in construction um, and you see that worldwide um, and also in fishing, any place where you can isolate a group of individuals away from help or an ability to escape, um, you're going to see uh, situations where, when, where then those folks can be exploited. And Bill, who, who are we typically seeing as trafficking victims uh, in either the sex trafficking or labor trafficking context? Yeah, so you, you mentioned earlier, you know, is there a, a certain demographic? And the reality is, is no. I mean, human trafficking is something that cuts across all races, ethnicities, genders, socioeconomic classes. Uh, it makes it very difficult sometimes for law enforcement to identify both the victims and the And I think that's something that's important to note. Uh, most human trafficking victims encounter the criminal justice system through other things, right? So on sex trafficking, oftentimes they may encounter through, uh, you know, prostitution or narcotics related offenses. Um, and, and that oftentimes can make it difficult for law enforcement to uh, identify uh, the situation that they actually have, uh, which is really the need for these specialized units. Um, and that was one of the things that made us so successful in Northern Virginia is we were able to specialize and uh, General Cuccinelli had a, a prosecutor from his office that was designated solely to work on this issue. Uh, Zach, you know, was was focused predominantly on this and then on, on the investigative side, really being able to understand the dynamics and how the, the illicit enterprises operate is really how you identify uh, these cases. But uh, really, um, given the right circumstances, anyone could be vulnerable to becoming a victim of trafficking. So you mentioned specialized units, Bill, as being one strategy that's that's worked to combat human trafficking. What are some other successful strategies uh, from any of you that, that you think has worked well uh, to kind of be able to lead to successful detection and prosecution uh, and really rescuing of, of human trafficking victims? 
I would say uh, awareness was key. We spent a lot of time focusing on awareness uh, because frankly, there's there are what I call certain points of rescue that can happen, whether that's um, a pharmacist who's dispensing, um, uh, you know, there were there were individuals who, you know, would go and, you know, need medication or need birth control um, who were being, you know, victimized, trafficking victims. Um, police officers, I spent a lot of time with, with Detective Wolf going around and training patrol officers because so many times these individuals would be pulled over and it'd be one young girl with four or five older men, um, a, a box of, of condoms, and, you know, their stories wouldn't check out. So we talked a lot about asking that one follow-up question, you know, give them a citation, don't harass anybody, but but ask, hey, what's the relationship? And oftentimes you get three or four different answers. Oh, it's my little sister. Oh, it's my girlfriend. And, and the stories wouldn't line up. Um, another key uh, folks were emergency room personnel. Uh, I spent a fair amount of time going out and speaking to folks in emergency rooms because, you know, at some point, someone generally in the uh, uh, trafficking victims going to get hurt um, physically or sexually. Uh, another place is um, managers of hotels and motels and their um, their cleaning staff um, and, and focusing on those people. And then we spent a lot of time talking to just the community and creating awareness, um, you know, whether that was folks who were at churches or different places and generating awareness so so we could get it. And before I, I see the, the mic, the last thing I would say is one thing that proved to be incredibly difficult and something that General Cuccinelli showed a lot of leadership on was um, it's one thing to figure out what's going on with trafficking. Most of these cases are what we call victim centric. You need the victims to prove them. What do you do with a juvenile who has a comorbidity of um, chemical dependence, sexual assault, um, survivorship, uh, mental health issues, as well as perhaps an unstable family home in, with which to return. And so the idea of creating special housing and creating special places where a trafficking victim can feel safe Get the get the mental health treatment they need, the physical and and, and sexual uh, assault um, uh, medical care that they need, as well as be at a facility where, in some cases, you know they need to stay and not leave because a lot of these juveniles um, they were so used to that life uh, and had been so. Um, just brutally victimized by these traffickers and in some cases brainwashed, you know, they would leave home uh, after being, quote, rescued and go back to their trafficker. And so um, I will say, I think one of the things that um, we talked a lot about then and we're still talking about now is the need for this specialized place housing center to deal with this unique issue of juvenile sex trafficking victims. One of the questions we got from our audience is, what can the general public do to combat human trafficking? What signs should we as members of the public be on the lookout for? And what's the best thing to do if we encounter a situation uh, that looks like potential human trafficking? I'll jump in real quick, Zach, and just say, you know, I think it's a great question and it really does take engagement from the communities. One of the things, uh, that I've been working on at the Department of Justice is really how do we uh, have that coordinated community response and that engage that is engaging all members of the community in doing that. There are lots of uh, great organizations out there uh, that will come and educate uh, your community specific to the signs, um, you know, whether it's a faith-based community, a civic community. So would highly encourage, uh, you know, some of the attendees to consider hosting some of uh, those types of events uh, where you can really start to to draw out. I think the other thing, you know, Zach was mentioning, you know, the awareness piece and, and partnering with your law enforcement agencies and others to go out and provide uh, sort of disciplinary specific training, right? That training for your hospitality industry, for schools uh, are truly on the front lines of this piece of it. Um, you know, transportation industry, healthcare workers, all of these other folks, but it really takes somebody in that community willing to initiate that um, and, and to be the driving force to kind of be that ambassador to the community. Another question we had from our audience was, uh, what's the relationship between uh, a lot of these large internet pornography websites and human trafficking and are there any policies uh, that should be implemented uh, to help mitigate any potentially uh, adverse impacts that these pornographic websites are having on human trafficking? 
Well, honestly, you don't you don't actually need to go to porn websites for human trafficking. I mean, there's there are uh, you know we've had issues with Craigslist. We've had a, we could go through things you've heard of where there are you know 99% of the use is legitimate and legal, uh, but this is buried back in there. And um, so we have partnered with uh, website owners, for instance, to police their own space. This has been a subject of some discussion lately in, in a broader context. Um, free speech is not the allowance or facilitation of crime or violence. And those are two different things, two different categories. And there doesn't tend to be much debate. Um, uh, about policing the latter. And so, but it does take effort on the part of those who are running these sites. Um, but then switching over to the question, you know, uh, the victimization, um, one element of victimization can be creating pornography um, as part of the sex trafficking undertaking. And it's it's one of those ongoing victimizations uh, for the individual involved because it's it's up there forever, you know, and um, um, efforts have been made to go after some of these sites um, and often successfully when they can be demonstrated to have a, a knowing facilitation. But some of them, um, when pressure is brought to bear, actually start cooperating, start policing their own material um, as gruesome as all of this may sound, there's a big difference between voluntary and coerced. I mean, it makes all the difference in the world to the individual involved um, who's being victimized potentially. So uh, that's an ongoing battle, Zach, and um, there's been some success in it over the years, but you know, the, the internet is always changing and part of the reason for it is to create these new opportunities. Um, uh, they, the sellers do need to connect to the buyers. I mean, Zach described uh, very straightforward ways that these connections get made in communities. You know, the gang members go back to their day job, um, offer it up, and um, and and you know that's a little tougher to police. Actually, that's where citizens who see that going on need to not step in, but to turn to their own local law enforcement. And let them know what they've what they've spotted, so law enforcement can take it over. But that's going to be an ongoing battle now and forever, as long as we have the internet. I, if I can add, um, sort of take the conversation a little bit of a different direction, and that is just to add in the element of demand and, and how we address the demand for, uh, you know, the, the commercial sex and and other things. And um, you know, I, I agree with the general question I said, and there are, you know, I mean, this is you know, open advertising, really. I mean, we can go to, to sites right now that we can access where this stuff is being advertised. But I think we also need to be considering that, um, you know, there is this other element. If there wasn't the demand for the services being provided, then we could, you know, potentially eliminate the problem. Uh, this is um, a topic of a, a great deal of discussion within the human trafficking field right now. Uh, and that is exactly how do we address demand? How do we define demand? Um, and so I, I would just I put that on your radar uh, because I think there's a lot of room for some serious policy discussions around uh, how do we address demand effectively uh, in in the broader strategy of approaching or dealing with human trafficking. And so I guess this leads us to, to kind of a, another question. You know, you've talked a little bit about what's worked, um, these cross-jurisdictional task force, uh, working closely among state, local, and, and federal authorities. Uh, if you were to, to talk to a, a member of Congress or a state legislator, uh, what would you ask them to, actions would you ask them to take, or what would help uh, combat and, and prosecute uh, those who are, are involved in human trafficking? I mean, one of the, from my perspective as a former federal prosecutor and running an office, what we really needed were probably three things. One would be, again, the housing piece is just huge. Um, there's a lot of money through the Office of Justice Programs, Austin Office of um, Victim, uh, Office of 
victims of crime and one of the things that you know seeing particular programming or particular um, programs and funding to go to address this problem um, in terms of grants that could go to particular institutions because it really is a unique place um, and it's a really unique uh, set of circumstances you have to address the second thing is um, translators we have a major problem when it comes to language barriers and as you can appreciate when you are talking to someone about the most traumatic thing likely they've ever been through whether it's human trafficking or labor trafficking and it's not um, you know just Spanish it's it's everything in between whether it's Tagalog whether it's um, Arabic um, you know there are a number of languages that we encounter especially you know up and down the eastern seaboard as we really are um, you know a, a very diverse uh, group of individuals um, in that area and you know when you're using the language line or you know someone doesn't speak a particular dialect it just it makes almost impossible to prove your case um, and the third thing is um, it really uh, it, it law enforcement is basically being asked to play the part of social workers and um, some of the detectives uh, who who work in this area I mean they're just tremendous like Detective Wolf where they have the right IQ and EQ and understand really how to deal with someone who's um, been a sexual assault victim and so I would say you know just increased training and specialization um, can make a big deal though I, I do think with the Trafficking Victims Protection Act um, which is 18 USC 1591, um, there's a lot that Congress gave us. Um, they gave us mandatory minimums as it relates to sex traffickers, and that mandatory minimum goes up depending as the vic as the age of the victim gets lower. Um, also, if there's forced fraud or coercion, that increase the, the mandatory minimum. Um, there's also a conspiracy um, aspect to that, so conspiring to, to commit sex trafficking. So even if you didn't directly put hands on someone, um, but you helped facilitate uh, a sex trafficking enterprise, um, and uh, there, there's also mandatory um, restitution provisions in there, so that if somebody, um, you know, uh, got their ill-gotten gains from from one of these um, enterprises, and then the individual um, sex trafficking victim has medical bills, psychiatric bills, other things, you've got it's mandatory, um, it's not optional that you have to pay restitution. So, with that particular statute, we statutorily we have some great tools. Um, it's just you know, focusing on making sure we can bring the victim back as absolutely much as possible and prove our case and hold those people accountable. So I, I as, as General Cuccinelli mentioned at the outset, this is one of the only issues, the only issues I've ever seen where there is truly, you know, 99.9% .9 and maybe 100% bipartisan support. And it is pretty amazing um, when you have an issue that truly does transcend politics, how much good can happen. And, and we've seen that on the Hill. I mean, every uh, every Human Trafficking Awareness Month, you get you know hundreds of members of Congress signing on um, to a proclamation. Um, you see, um, you know, uh, different pieces of language attached to other bills, and everyone agrees on this part. So um, I think what I would tell members of Congress are, you know, we need specific money for uh, for victims, we need specific money for victims' housing. Um, we need uh, linguistic services, um, and we need to make sure we are training uh, and giving really good training to our patrol officers because they're going to be the ones who first interaction with them, then our detectives going to deal with them. Yeah, if I could add to that, um, sure. I, I agree with everything Zach just said, and I, I would give you kind of a state-federal interaction that. The statute that Zach referred to is from, I wanna say 2008, the TVPRA, and I became AG in 2010. And having those mandatory minimums really made it worth it in my office to turn my staff over to partner with the Eastern District of Virginia where Zach was working and where, where Detective Wolf as well was doing his work. It, and um, it gave us a path and we had a great partner there in Neil McBride, who at that time was the U.S. Attorney, one of uh, Zach's predecessors, um, and uh, it was a very good partnership. And um, having said that, at that time, if I were to go county by county, just using Northern Virginia, and Bill could speak to this in probably painful detail, some of them uh, were more enthusiastic about bringing these as state cases than others. Um, it wasn't as clean a fit with the way the law was written. The laws 
we were using were extortion laws, not laws written for the purpose of identifying and prosecuting human trafficking and aiding the victims. And um, to, to sort of pound home one of the points Zach made, because I think it's very wise of him, it's easy for us to talk about the front end, the law enforcement. How do we spot it? How do we get them? And most people only think that far. But what Zach described to you is the language support, the housing and victim support, the back end, if you will, after the, after the fact. And that is so critical in this space um, and so hard. The, the people recovering from this sort of trafficking, um, they, they have a long way to go, much longer than most other types of victims that any of us ever deal with. And uh, so having those pieces in place and in sufficient quantity to actually handle the number of victims that we're identifying and trying to help is also critical. And that's the state has a role to play. The federal government has a role to play and localities themselves have roles to play as well. So that partnership is very important in making that happen. Great. You know, I, I don't mean to, to beat a dead horse, but I do just want to drive this point home. Uh, you know, when we look at these these aftercare or, or after interdiction sort of needs, uh, you know, the Department of Justice realized last year uh, what an incredible need there was for housing. And so for the first time in FY20, we had a housing program to fund uh, these facilities for victims of human trafficking. Um, you know, it was under the leadership of uh, Principal Deputy Assistant Attorney General Katie Sullivan, who really saw that need and directed those resources. And we invested $35 million. And I'll tell you, we got more applications uh, than we could ever have, have thought we would have gotten. I mean, that money just went right out the door. We originally had allocated 13 million for the program and ended up funding 35 million. Um, but I think the, the thing to really understand is we talk about the Trafficking Victims Protection Act and all these efforts that have been going on for 20 years. Well, FY20 was the first year we ever invested money specifically in housing, right? So there's still a lot of needs uh, moving forward, and I think it's really important that we ensure that those priorities remain on the forefront and we continue to invest the money um, in through federal grant dollars uh, into these programs that are necessary, like housing and language access for victims. Great. One of the, the questions we got from an audience member, I think Zach or, or Bill, you mentioned that you trained uh, police officers uh, when making stops, uh, what to recognize uh, in terms of who may be a trafficking victim. One of our audience members asked, uh, other than traffic stops, uh, what types of uh, crimes, uh, when police officers respond, what types of crimes typically are associated with human trafficking and what types of calls when they respond have they traditionally found trafficking victims? Go ahead, Billy, if you want to take that one. If not, I'm happy to. But you're the only one of us who actually got to carry a badge. If uh, if I miss any, uh, let me know. But you know, it, it really it intersects a lot of different ways. Uh, oftentimes through uh, narcotic violations, even small things like noise complaints. Right, uh, law enforcement may encounter a victim of human trafficking at a at a hotel uh, because there's an argument or a domestic dispute, domestic violence cases, uh, alcohol violations, disorderly conduct uh, type cases. Um, uh, missing missing juveniles uh, when you're looking for a missing kid, uh, as as we've all mentioned, you know the gang related activities as well. Uh, simply, there were cases where we simply encountered a, a group of gang members at a party for per se, and we were able to pull a human trafficking case out of that situation. Um, so it, it really in a lot of different different ways. Um, that you can really encounter human trafficking and it really intersects with a lot of different types of crimes on the labor trafficking side even uh employee employer disputes uh we had we found one uh pretty significant size labor trafficking case when an employee reported to the department of labor that they didn't think that they were getting adequate compensation and that really launched uh, an investigation that initially started as sort of a civil investigation that quickly turned into a, a large-scale criminal investigation. And one of the, the questions that we had for today is, 
you know, I know Zach, you mentioned this is a bipartisan issue uh, by and large. And so do any of you anticipate that there will be differences uh, between the Biden administration's priorities in enforcing human trafficking and combating human trafficking uh, compared to the, the Trump's administration's priorities? And if so, uh, what would those differences most likely be? I'll, 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 um, I'm sure General Cuccinelli, <clears throat> excuse me, General Cuccinelli can answer for DHS. From a DOJ perspective, you know, this is something uh, that really has been bipartisan. There's uh, two sections at the Department of Justice, and I'll try not to do the DC acronym thing, but there's one, the Child Exploitation and Obscenity section that works on juvenile trafficking cases, and then a and part of the Civil Rights um, section at Maine DOJ um, called the Human Rights and Special Prosecution section that deals with adult trafficking. And so, that's going to continue regardless of whether it's a Republican or a Democratic administration. Um, one of the other things I can say is that I think we're all, and, and this is more General Cuccinelli's territory, but we're all uh, in favor of the particular visa programs um, for uh, victims of trafficking, whether it's S visas or T visas. And as a um, as a prosecutor, I, I signed off on a lot of those. So someone who doesn't otherwise have lawful status here, um, using the visa program uh, as a way to make sure, you know, they're not going to be deported back to a country where they may face um, even more uh, uh, mm -hmm. issues um, due to, you know, there's certain countries where if you get deported back and it's, you know, determined that you are a sex trafficking victim, you'll be killed. So um, I, I would assume all those things would continue. Um, one thing that I will say is, uh, as an administration that that comes in, you have to deal with the crisis that's right in front of you. And so for many of us um, who served over the last four years, we were dealing with soaring violent crime rates, you know, firearm offense, uh, firearms offenses, rapes, carjackings. We also had the deadliest, um, you know, drug crisis in quite a long time with the fentanyl and opioid crisis. And so what I would say in, in being a relatively high functioning district, a large district, that spans both, you know, rich suburbs in Northern Virginia and then some really tough uh, urban areas, um, you know, in other parts of the Eastern District of Virginia, you know, I sort of had everything. Um, and I will tell you that when you were focused on rooting out, um, you know, Chinese sourced fentanyl that, you know, a, a an amount that's like the size of a grain of sand could kill somebody, um, you're also dealing with, you know, shootings that are that are going through the roof. Um, you're also dealing with a global pandemic. Um, it can be hard to make sure you're prioritizing everything. So I would say that if we continue to have the spiking violent crime rates that we're having now, if we're continuing to deal with the opioid and now even a meth crisis, um, it can be hard to prioritize everything because there's only so much money and there's only so much time. So I would imagine that the incoming Biden administration will make this a priority um, as, as the last administration did. They will keep focusing on this, um, but frankly, with um, all these other, uh, uh, you know, front of mind issues, um, you have to keep uh, bailing the boat or flying the plane or whatever analogy you want to use. So I think it's going to be difficult for this administration, just like it was for the last, uh, to address all these problems simultaneously. But that, that's what we do. Yeah, I think I think the two potential negative differences are, I, I agree with what Zach had said in terms of the priorities and competing priorities. I think where the Biden administration, and it's only been a week, but they have shown a propensity um, on even on things that were unarguably good policy by the Trump administration with, on an objective basis, no partisanship at all. They've pulled the plug on a number of those just because they were Trump's. And I am concerned about some of that here, and I'll be specific and move into my second concern area, and that is the crossover between particularly illegal immigration and sex trafficking, which is overwhelmingly, though not exclusively, um, a North and South America phenomenon. You know, so MS-13, Latin Kings, you know, you've got, you've got the gangs here that uh, were born out of Guatemala, El Salvador, Honduras, um, that are involved in the trafficking. I mean, those are the people that Zach was describing earlier. Um, there are some of the folks that Bill has encountered over the years uh, as a detective. And um, 
I am concerned that the politics of immigration, uh, of illegal immigration specifically, will impede um, their ardor in getting after some of these pathways. Um, and uh, time will tell, and I hope that's not true, but it's hard to imagine when you're effectively opening your borders, the people who control those crossing points are allied with the gangs that are doing most of the sex trafficking. Um, and I'm talking about the Mexican drug cartels, and they're involved in the drug epidemics that Zach was also referring to, and they're making big money off of all that. Um, that is a major concern for me in the human trafficking space, is that we're going to take the pressure off of those pipelines, because the same pipelines that are used to move drugs in, are used to move illegal aliens in, are, move, are used for sex trafficking as well on an international basis. Um, so that's only one part of the problem, but it is one where I think you'll see unfortunately, substantially less pressure put by this administration than you did see from the last administration. Sure. Bill, would you like to, to add anything? Well, I think, you know, we're kind of in a, a holding pattern to see, you know, what, what the priorities are. You know, I'm, I'm hopeful, uh, you know, to Zach's point that they will continue to prioritize this as an issue. Uh, you know, we have seen the amount of funding um, relative to, you know, grant making and supporting the, the state and local efforts uh, has grown exponentially over the past several years. Uh, and so, you know, my hope is that we'll continue to see a push uh, to increase the amount of funding um, available uh, for that. Um, I think there there are a few issues that, uh, you know, yet to be seen sort of how they're prioritized particularly the discussion around uh, the decriminalization of prostitution, uh, you know, and how that impacts. So I think there's going to be a lot of work to be done um, as, as some of these priorities are advanced. Great. One of our audience members asked, uh, for folks who are looking to get involved with the fight against human trafficking or who want to help victims of human trafficking, uh, do any of you have good organizations uh, you would recommend to those folks that they could reach out to or, or partner with to, to do that? Yes. Uh, you know, I, I would say, um, and I don't mind you sharing my contact information with anybody. Uh, I'm happy for them to reach out directly and just kind of see specifically where their interest level is and geographically where they're located uh, and happy to, to provide them with a list of organizations that might they might be interested in partnering with. One that I'll give a plug for is I've, I've been fortunate enough to work with the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, NICMIC, which was founded uh, by John and Rave Walsh um, following the abduction and, and murder of their son, Adam Walsh. You, some of you may be familiar with him from America's Most Wanted and some other things. Um, it's not necessarily the same when we talk about human trafficking and we talk about uh, missing and exploited children. You can have children who are kidnapped and children who are abused um, and children who are who are missing or, or runaways. But one thing that seems to be a very common thread, uh, at least in my anecdotal experience, and I believe that of Detective Wolfs as well, is if you are a, a child or a juvenile um, and you are running away, the link and the, the vulnerability and the dangers with um, being falling victim to trafficking go through exponentially. Um, an, another that I will say that um, runs the hotline is one that um, General Cuccinelli mentioned earlier in the Polaris project. But uh, to, to Detective Wolf's point, there, are, it, there are, depending on what you want to do, if it's if it's to support it financially or if it's to get involved, um, this is one of those areas where there's just a tremendous amount um, of information and opportunity opportunity. And for those of you who want to continue to educate yourselves, whether it's going to the Department of Justice website or the uh, Department of Homeland Security Blue campaign, um, there are just some amazing resources out there to just increase your awareness. And one thing that I would do is talk to your talk, uh, talk to your appropriate 
moderately aged children about this. Um, and also, you know, talk to your neighbors about this. Um, that those of you who coach youth sports and other things, I mean, one of the cases that Detective Wolf um, worked uh, was involved individuals who were engaging in this conduct uh, in between school and um, or when they left school and were coming home to do their homework in you know half million dollar homes in Northern Virginia. This is not simply something that afflicts folks who are in the lower, sec lower socioeconomic status or minorities. Um, this, ha this could be anyone. Um, and so it's, it's important to, one of the first things you can do is educate yourself and then talk to your loved ones about it. That's fantastic. Uh, well, we are coming close to the end of our, our time together here today. And so before we, we uh, leave our event today, uh, I would like to go around one last time. And if anyone has uh, final thoughts they would like to leave with our, our audience here today, uh, you know, I think we'd all certainly appreciate uh, hearing that. And if it's okay, uh, Ken, we'll start with you. Sure, I, uh, you know, this is an area that was introduced to me, oh gosh, 15 years ago by Frank Cannon and Jeff Bell, who some people, uh, watching undoubtedly know. Uh, Jeff has since passed away um, and they opened my eyes to the problem. That was around 2005, 2006. And, and it was a, at that time trying to get legislation to help in this space. I faced a Democrat governor and a Republican attorney general, both of whom said, you know, this isn't really a problem. So uh, we don't think you should pass this legislation, which pretty well killed it. Um, and one of the motives to run for attorney general was you get to act on your own as an executive and it's one of the things in the executive branch that is a real positive versus being a legislator and by doing that we were able to apply our own manpower um bill wolf was one of the fastest partners that we encountered and he'll uh, both of these guys know aaron culpa who was a, is a whirlwind in Virginia on this subject, worked in my office at that time, and we really just unleashed her. And, um, you know, it's that first realization, once people accept that it exists, then the kind of bipartnership that both Zach and I were referring to really takes hold in my view. And, um, you know, so for the people who are watching, if you're in a community that hasn't reached that point, um, I'm sure any one of us would be happy to <laughs> talk to some of your local official, officials and help them see it in their own community, because unfortunately it's everywhere. Um, there's no immunity to this. The case Zach was referring to, if I remember correctly, started with the daughter of a friend of mine with a 3.9 GPA in Fairfax County Public Schools um, in a not broken home. I mean, so when 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 they tell you it's across race, ethnicity, and, and social status and everything, they're not kidding. I mean, all the way up. And um, so it's that kind of awareness that is necessary and then actually moving. It's great to have bipartisanship on something, but then you have to move forward intelligently. But there's a lot of opportunity in the states to do this in addition to the federal government. And the federal government, I think it's a lot of applying the resources that are there. Um, I thought Bill's point about, you know, it took all the way to 2020 to be applying money to the housing problem that I think Zach explained so very well um, for the victims. Um, that problem's been there all along, um, but the money's just now showing up to address that problem. So we, we have more to do. There's plenty to do for people who are passionate about this, and it's an easy subject to get passionate about. And, um, and, and it's a, uh, it's a very rewarding one to work in. And, uh, you know, just as someone who's been in it in Virginia and nationally, I appreciate what Bill Wolf did at, on, on the street in this area. I appreciate what Zach's been doing for years in the Eastern District um, to, to connect possible cases to actual convictions. Uh, that was a big deal to me as an attorney general. It's a big deal to me as a citizen of Virginia. And, um, and and it's that kind of partnership that needs to be replicated all over the country. Great. Uh, Bill, over to you. But, you know, Zach, I just want to thank you and the Heritage Foundation again for, for putting this on and, and really, you know, you've, you've heard us all talk about awareness and the importance of awareness. And so I uh, certainly appreciate Heritage Foundation doing doing their part in, in helping to, to bring, bring light to the issue. 
you know, I think um, th this is such an interesting panel because, you know, we all have diverse backgrounds, uh, and, and, but you can see that how we all came together in Virginia uh, to really impact the issue. And I think that's really what it's about. It's about that, that multidisciplinary collaborative approach to addressing the problem, uh, to raising awareness, really engagement. It's something, you know, human trafficking, if we want to ignore it, it's easy to ignore. It, it can operate in the shadows uh, and we can go about our daily lives until, General Cuccinelli mentioned, it impacts somebody that we know, right? Our neighbor, our friend, or fortunately, in some cases, in our own family. And so I just think it is a, a call to be vigilant, to engage on this issue, uh, to continue to advance uh, strong policies that are that work toward uh, protection, prosecution, but also the prevention piece as well. Uh, I had the, um, the pleasure of speaking to the first spouses uh, event this morning on the issue where the focus really was on prevention. So I see a lot of that being uh, sort of the, the next gen, if you will, of uh, the fight against human trafficking. And I think all of us play a part in that. So uh, encourage all the audience members today uh, to, to find a way to engage, to learn more, uh, to do their part in their communities, and certainly thankful that they took the time today uh, to hear what we had to say. So again, Zach. Great. Thanks, Bill. And Zach, over to you. Yeah, I'll be brief. Um, just a couple other things for those who remain interested and took the time to tune in. Um, thank you for that. Uh, a couple other resources or things you may want to check out or not know about. There's something at the State Department called the Trafficking in Persons Office, um, and there's actually something called the TIP Ambassador, Trafficking in Persons. They put out a report every year, and it's global, um, but I think it's one of the best products I've seen in terms of all types of trafficking, whether it's sex trafficking, labor trafficking, or organ trafficking. Another organization, um, it does have a religious uh, bent to it, is the International Justice Mission. Very impressed with what they do, and, and their model is um, educating lawyers and advocates overseas in countries um, so that if the judicial system's broken and no one advocates for victims, you know, we don't just throw money at the problem. And, and that was a, a, an organization that was started in uh, an individual's garage and is now global. So there's there's lots of opportunities both domestically and globally to get involved in. Again, just want to thank um, Heritage and you know it's it's really neat to literally be seeing the fruition of federal, state, and local collaboration. That's a buzzword you hear a lot of prosecutors talk about. But when it comes to human trafficking, you have to have the street level intelligence. You have to have the backing of the highest law enforcement official in the state, and then you need some of the resources of the feds. And when that actually works, and we put our differences aside and come together and don't get in each other's way, it's it's pretty amazing. Great, thanks, Zach. Well, on behalf of the Heritage Foundation, I really want to thank all of our panelists for being here today, for sharing their insights and experiences. This was a, a fantastic event. And I also want to thank our audience for joining us. Uh, like all of our panelists said, this is an important issue that definitely uh, needs a lot of attention. And so, again, thank you all for being here and participating in this. Uh, if you work at a Hill, a think tank, or anyone else that just wants more information about this topic, uh, please feel free to contact me using the contact uh, information listed on the screen. I'd love to, to discuss the issue with you and continue the conversation. Uh, for our audience members, immediately following the event, you'll receive our survey uh, that will hopefully allow you to let us know what other events and ideas and topics you would like for Heritage to, to discuss going forward. Uh, to check out the events that Heritage has coming up, uh, please go to heritage.org backslash events. And again, I really want to thank Ken, Bill, and Zach for being here today, being part of this fantastic panel, uh, sharing their experience with all of us. Uh, it was very informative and, and very uh, eye-opening. So thank you all. And again, thank you all for being here. With that, we'll be dismissed. <laughs>